I want to tell you about the power of the gospel. And then I'll bring it home at the end of, uh, at the, end of the sermon. You may know or you may not know of a guy who passed away in 1940. But his name was Melvin E. Trotter. Anybody heard that name before? Mel Trotter? Let me tell you about this guy. He was one of seven children, born to a bartender in 1870. His father was a drunkard. He drank, quote, as much as he served. While Melvin tended bar at 17 is when Melvin himself began drinking, he learned the barbering trade and began to make a pretty good living, but he also started gambling and drinking fairly heavily. At age 19, he left home. So he moved to Pearl City, Illinois, where he met and married a gal named Lottie Fisher. Mel continued to drink and gamble even after they moved to Davenport, <clears throat> Iowa. They had children, Mel Trotter and when his son was about two years old, Trotter returned home after a 10-day drunken spree. He found the child dead in his mom's arms, and he felt like a murderer. Suicide entered his mind, but he didn't have the courage. When they were at the funeral, he put his arms around his dead boy, in the casket and swore that he would never touch liquor again and immediately after the funeral he was so drunk he was staggering home and couldn't see where he was he hopped on a freight train left his family on January 19th 1897 and it rolled into Chicago a little bit north it was a blizzard in Chicago he sold his shoes on a bitter cold January night for one more drink and headed to Lake Michigan to commit suicide. He stopped at the bar to get the last drink, got kicked out. He had no money, he had no shoes, he had no home, no friends, and it was in the middle of a Chicago blizzard. He was staggering along the street, heading toward the lake, when someone nudged him inside Pacific Garden Mission. On the platform was Harry Monroe. It was the, he was the superintendent of the mission at the time. At the close of the service, Harry Monroe asked to see the hands of anybody who wanted to be saved. Mel raised his hand for prayer. He walked forward and was led to Christ. He was 27. For 40 years, Mel Trotter, along with a couple of his brothers, George and Will, were some of the most influential men of the Gospel Rescue Mission movement. In fact, he led hundreds and hundreds of drunkards to the Lord. His Sunday school program at the mission was so vibrant, on a weekly basis, he had between three and five hundred children where they were getting food, they were being evangelized to, and they were being taught the Word of God. His father was a drunk. You know what his mom was, Mel Trotter's mom? She was a praying Christian. I just want to throw that in there. His mom had always been praying for him. He was one of the most successful missionaries in the gospel rescue mission movement of the 1900s to the 1940s. Amazingly enough, the gospel changed Mel Trotter's life. He changed my life. The gospel has changed all of our lives. So that's what today's message is about. Bow with me in prayer as we consider our sermon text. Father, I thank you that over a hundred years ago you decided to use this 
drunken, uh, wreck of a man. And you brought into life gospel mission organizations across the country. Thousands of people gave their life to the Lord. And I thank you that that power, the power of the gospel, lives in us and we can bank on it. I pray, Jesus, now you'd use my words and you would use the scripture to transform us more and more into the likeness of your son, especially as we close in on those pearly gates. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our sermon text comes out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We have in front of us some of the richest teaching from Paul on what happens to dead men. What happens to their bodies? This is the richest teaching. It's a long chapter. It's 58 verses. I'm not preaching all of them. But it is incredibly instructional. If you are wondering, what happens to me when I die? We get to uncover that over the next few weeks. I'm asking you, please read chapter 15 a couple times this coming week as you consider, what does this have to do with me? So here we're going. We've got three avenues that I want to cover. One, here's a road map for our success in today's sermon. One is, we're going to talk about the evidence of Christ's resurrection. How do we know that Christ actually came out of the grave? Two, we're going to talk about this false teaching that came up in the Corinthian church, that dead men don't rise, actually. It's a false hypothesis. A false teaching that dead men do not rise. And the third thing that we're going to talk about is what does Christ's resurrection mean for me? So, I started with the story this morning of Mel Trotter because I feel so particularly drawn to him. Not that I am like that, but my heart is, was like that before I met the Lord. And the Corinthian church was like that too. Please go to uh, 1 Corinthians 6. I want you to see what the Corinthians were saved from. Just a couple verses in 1 Corinthians 6. And you can see that the power of the gospel did a mighty work in the church as well. Verse 9. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. It's a lot like Mel Trotter's story. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of our God. I may not have been like that, but my heart was dark nonetheless until I gave my heart to the Lord at seven years old. My heart was dark as dark could be. I was like that. Paul says, and such were some of you. The gospel, the gospel changed them. So, 15 verse 1 starts out like this. I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you believed in vain. Let's stop there for a second. So Paul is reminding them of the gospel. We read how they got changed in chapter 6. Paul preached to them, and it was their, uh, what saved them. He said, it is not only did you receive it with open arms, we saw that in chapter 6, they received it and it changed them, but... They are standing in it, and by which you are being saved. The gospel message is continuously saving you, turning you into more and more of being like the image of Jesus Christ. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, I, I don't really want to go there, but um, what does that mean? If you hold fast, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, I decided I was going to just talk about that for a second. What does that mean? If you hold fast... God's end of the deal, 
is an eternal saving, a forever loving, always holding you, I will never let you go, and what's our end of the deal? It's the same. It's holding fast to the gospel. Those two go hand in hand. So, now we're into our first point. We must see the evidence of Christ's resurrection. Paul is going to build an argument. I preached this to you and you received it. Do you remember what it was? It was the gospel. Let me uncover it for you. We all have a common ground here. We're all holding this. And Paul's going to start there because he's a logician, meaning he's going to take them from what they believe and now introduce, wait, how did this false teaching get in here? What do we believe? What did you receive with open arms? What was it that changed your life from chapter 6, verse 9, which we read? We, gotta, we have to be on the same page as the Corinthians. So, he's going to go over the gospel, and in particular, Christ's resurrection. Verse 3. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, that, uh, uh, with, in accordance with Scripture, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day, in accordance with the Scriptures. Then that He appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. Then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Now, the evidence of Christ's resurrection is established because if Christ didn't rise, dead men don't rise. That's the connection, okay? If Christ was not actually raised from the dead, then we don't raise from the dead. But they believed this. But they believed, they already believed that Jesus rose from the dead. That's the, that's the part of the gospel. He died for our sins, he was buried, and he raised uh, to life again. So, what does Paul present as the evidence of Christ's resurrection? If you look at verse 1, it was... The evidence of the local church. How could the local church have been so changed as we already read? If Christ didn't rise, how could they have changed so much? Mel Trotter changed. The Corinthian church changed. I have changed. How could that happen if Christ didn't actually rise? And that's right in verse 1. The gospel I preached to you, which you received. They received it. It changed their heart. Christ rose because the local church is evidence. Two, Christ rose because it was foretold in Scripture. Uh, in verse 3, he says that his death was foretold in Scripture. We have that in Isaiah 53. We have that in Psalm 22. We have that in Genesis 22 when Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac as a type. And we have that in all the sacrificial lambs, all the thousands of lambs. This is a foreshadowing that there will be a perfect lamb. That was foretold in Scripture. But we also have his resurrection foretold in Scripture. It says in verse 4, He was buried, he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Where does it say that? Psalm 16, I read it for our call to worship. You will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. All the Old Testament Jews believed that the righteous one, the Messiah, would not see death. Jesus did not see and has not seen death. He rose victoriously. Also, you can look at Moses and the serpent. There's a story of, of um, Moses in the wilderness and the people complaining and they get bitten by snakes and Moses holds up a bronze serpent and, and God says, if the people look at the bronze serpent, they will be saved. Jesus equated himself just as Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness, so many will be saved. Jesus 
raised up and those who looked on him would be saved. Also, in Hosea 6, verse 2, and I just want to read that because it may not be familiar to you. It was to the Old Testament Jews. He says, after two days he will revive us and on the third day he will raise us up. Old Testament Jews believed that meant Jesus, the Messiah, in three days would raise up. Scripture is also clear in Mark 8. Jesus himself starts telling his disciples that he would die and he would be raised. So the evidence of Christ's resurrection is not only the local church and how transformed they were, but it was also evidenced in, in the scripture. In the third place that Paul illuminates to in these 11 verses, Christ's resurrection had eyewitness accounts. Look at verse 5. He appeared to Cephas. Then he appeared to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at once. Most of whom, by the way, are still alive. When Paul wrote this, they were still living. Though some have fallen asleep. Some more eyewitnesses. Then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles, last of all. As to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. So, the evidence that Christ actually rose from the dead was incredibly powerful saints. Paul lists Cephas first. That's Peter. Peter was the rock on which the church was built. Acts chapter 1 through 9, I think, or 11, is all about Peter's ministry. So, why he lists Peter? You know Peter, the saint. David even writes, as for the saints of the land, they are the excellent ones in Psalm 16. Jesus appeared to saints. These are not some ho-hum people. This is Peter, Saint Peter, the rock on which the church was built. Then he appeared to the twelve. If you were an early Christian, the twelve meant something big. The twelve meant these guys are the pillars of the church. Jesus also appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. So if you are wondering, okay, so Jesus rose from the grave and he appeared to Peter and the 12. Yeah, but those guys, you know, they were with him the whole time and they could have made a story up. How do you get past the quantity of people? 500 people. How do you get past the quantity of people? And in case you don't believe, a lot of them are still alive, so go and ask them. A, little, a few of them have fallen asleep. A few of them have died. But he appeared to more than 500 at one time. Jesus actually rose from the grave and appeared to 500 people at one time. So you've got the quality. He appeared to Peter, the quality of the man, the quality of the twelve. You've got the quantity of 500. Okay, yeah, but these people all love the Lord anyway. Okay, what about James, the half-brother of Jesus, who, John says in chapter 7, he did not believe in Jesus. He said, hey, Jesus, you go up to Jerusalem. Everybody wants to see your works, and if you want to be known, you've got to go up to Jerusalem because in John chapter 7 it says he didn't even believe in him. Now you have... Jesus appearing to a skeptic. So he appears to Peter, the rock. He appears to the twelve. He appears to five hundred. You can't pass that. He appears to a skeptic. Paul lists him, his half-brother. Jesus appears to James, and James later writes the letter. Fully converted. No longer a skeptic. I saw the risen Lord, my half-brother. And... He appeared to Paul. Now we know that story. Paul on the road of Damascus going to kill Christians, sees a blinding light, sees Jesus the Lord and says, why are you persecuting me? Paul lists himself because not only was he not a believer, not only was he not one of the 12, he wasn't one of the 500, he wasn't just a skeptic, he was a persecutor. Talk about the gospel changing. Paul is saying, I used to murder Christians. This is how you know Jesus is real. He really rose from the grave. He appeared to me. I was a murderer. 
the evidence of Christ's resurrection can be undeniable. It's first found in the local church in their transformation. You can't deny Jesus Christ based on the changes in your life. You can't deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ based on what was foretold in Scripture. You cannot deny it based on these eyewitness accounts. And even me, I was a murderer. I was a persecutor. Paul goes into great detail to tell us that Jesus really rose from the grave because we have to be firm there. Because now, as we get into our second point, a teaching arose that goes contrary to Jesus' resurrection. And that is that dead people don't actually rise from the grave. So here's my second point. The false teaching that dead men don't rise is squashed primarily because Jesus rose. Look at verse 12. If Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, what does that mean? Christ was being preached in their churches that he was raised from the dead. He said, now if Christ is pro proclaimed as raised from the dead, if you guys are preaching that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and verses 1 through 11, we believe this and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to refresh your memory that he actually rose, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? But there's whisperings. Yeah, guys, actually, that may have happened. Jesus may have risen. We believe that. But your body isn't going to come out of the grave. People were teaching that. So Paul is going to entertain the hypothesis just for a little bit. Read with me from verse 13. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. Then those also who've fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Now, we are going to enter this logical, lock-tight argument that all of us believe, that all of us stand in common with, that you can't pull out one piece and not have this argument fall apart. If dead people, Paul says, don't rise to life again, then here are some ramifications. I've pulled out five. If dead people don't rise again, then the first was that Jesus Christ was never even raised. If dead people don't come to life again, then Jesus himself was never raised. Verse 13, verse 15, and verse, 17, and verse 16. Verse 13, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Verse 15, we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it's true that the dead are not raised. Verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. That's the first major, uh, the major argument that Paul says, you cannot be raised from the dead if Christ didn't rise. The false teaching also, if dead people don't raise to life again, then the second part is the apostles in all their preaching was useless. All those people that Paul just mentioned, Peter, the twelve, five hundred at once, James, the half-brother, Paul, all these pillars, all of their preaching was useless. Look at verse 14. If Christ hasn't been raised, then our preaching is in vain. <clears throat> Can you imagine guys like Riley? Guys like Riley, who devote their life to preaching the Word of God. Guys like well-known pastors. We have John MacArthur and who are some other ones? Chuck Colson, Chuck Mislet, and Timothy Keller, and Riley Palmer, and all these other people. I'm on the list twice. <laughs> all these people that we 
really revere and respect. All the hours and hours that they've spent preaching and devoting their life to it, being totally vain. And not just that, but all the apostles. If dead people don't rise to life again, then they're preaching. Every word that comes out of their mouth every Sunday, every missions event, every conference is vain. My goodness. You pick out one thing, oh, the dead aren't raised. Then you have destroyed thousands of preaching hours and thousands of lives, millions of lives of people that have devoted their life to preaching. Oh, dead people don't rise. You take that one little argument and look what happens. Look what happens to the devotion of all their lives. The, sec the third thing that I pull out of there is not just their preaching. What does he say? Christian faith is useless. Christian faith is futile and pitiful. If the dead are not raised to life, then your Christian faith is stupid. It's pitiful. Verse 14, the end of the verse. If Christ hasn't been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Verse 17. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. And in verse 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, as in if we're not raised, if we only hope in this life, then we are of all people most to be pitied. Not just preaching is in vain. Not was Christ's life, just he didn't actually rise. But you're also saying that your faith and the millions of people that believe in a resurrected Lord is futile. Fourth thing, God is a liar. If the dead are not raised, then you are saying God is a liar. Because then there's no salvation from sin if Christ didn't rise. Verse 15 says we are even found to be misrepresenting God. Because we are testifying that God raised Christ. Then you're saying, if, if you say, yeah, the dead are not raised, then you're saying God is a liar. Because God didn't raise Christ. And then there is really no salvation from sin. And I'm going to turn to this story. I'll let you guess the story that I'm reading. In your mind, just think, okay, where is this place, where is this taking place? And listen to these few verses. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die." Yet shall he live, and everyone who believes and lives in me shall never die. Do you believe this? You know the story, right? That's the story of Jesus about to raise Lazarus from the dead. We are saying that that's a lie, then. If, if dead people aren't raised to life, then there's actually no salvation in Jesus. Now, the last thing is if the dead people aren't raised then Christ hasn't actually risen, and all believers of all time have perished. Look at verse 18. Then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. He doesn't mean just died. He means eternally dead. Then everybody of all time, all believers, if the dead aren't raised, they're all eternally dead. Boy, it sure takes our faith and squashes it. This is a very bad teaching. This is a very dangerous teaching. If in your ears you hear something like this in your life, or you have heard, guys, physical bodies don't actually come out of the ground. Physical bodies don't actually get brought to life again. This is what they're saying. Paul is uncovering that. If that's true, then Christ didn't raise. Because dead people don't rise if Christ didn't rise. Christ was the first. And, and uh, uh, Pastor Riley will go into that more next week. But if Christ didn't rise, then dead people don't rise. Okay, so in our roadmap, I wanted to uncover the evidence that Christ actually rose from the grave. I wanted to cover this false hypothesis that dead people don't rise. 
It's false. And the third thing that I wanted to cover was, what does Christ's resurrection mean for me? Here we get into the application. What does Christ's resurrection mean for you? If you are to think about it and really set your heart on it this week, as you're reading chapter 15, set your heart on it and say, Jesus, what does it mean that you beat death? I mean, for me. Let me give you some hints. Christ's resurrection changes everything. Christ's resurrection changes everything. It is the cornerstone of our Christian faith. If He didn't rise, we have no Christianity. There is no gospel without Christ's resurrection. His life, His death, and His resurrection. That's the gospel. What was His life? It was perfect. It was the fulfilling of the law. What was His death? The sacrifice, the all-atoning sacrifice for all man's sin for all time. And His resurrection was the stamp, boom, approved by God. As if Christ doesn't rise then there's no stamp of victory. He says, I did it, God. Not only did I pay it, I rose again. And God says, victory. Approved. Forever. The gospel has to include those three things. His life, His death, and His resurrection. What does Christ's resurrection mean for me? It changes everything. It changes everything. Hopefully, the second thing as you're meditating on it this week is that it reorients your hope in daily life. Paul says in verse 19, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, if we're just going, Oh, Jesus, thank you for you know, being a good teacher, and I know that when I die, nothing else happens. If we have hope in this life only, we're most to be pitied because Christians stake their life on eternal hope. That's the whole point of being a Christian. Yeah, this may stink right now, but guess what, guys? I'm working for treasures in heaven. That's our whole point of existing. If the resurrection doesn't change, if it doesn't reorient your hope, you are failing. If you are not thinking about eternity with God, you got to get on the same track. Paul says, oh, it's pitiful if you only have hope in this life. We know this life is broken. What does Christ's resurrection mean for you? I want you to consider how it should reorient your hope in daily life. I get stuck on a mower, day in, day out. And I'm at this person's yard, and I'm mowing. I can change my hope. This, this, maybe this doesn't have eternal significance, but God, what? I can change my hope. God, you got something good for me here. And if it's not here in this life, it's just a few hours away on the other side of flesh. And the last thing, I think, there may be more as you consider the passage. What does Christ's resurrection mean for me? I don't get to preach on this, but it means that there will be a physical, literal transformation of your dead body. Amen. Amen. Riley gets to preach on that. I wish I could, but I just want you to know, Christ's resurrection means we rise. Because if Christ didn't rise, we don't rise. I want to conclude there. I want to conclude with a word of prayer. And then the benediction. Bow your heads with me. 
Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, the pillars of our church, the missionaries, oh Lord, <laughs> they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after any other God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their name on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion in my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places indeed. I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I've set the Lord always before me. Because he's at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. Please stand.